Welcome once again, I'm Dan John, and today we want to go over the most important thing about coaching. I call it Coaching 101, The Fundamentals. Uh, I teach a course in college, and uh, 101 typically means in American universities, this is the survey course. This is the course you take to get the big picture of things, and of course, the rest of your degree is then, you know, filling in the gaps. Let's start with that, and let's remember that so much of coaching is filling in the gaps. So when I first talk to people about coaching, uh, to me, the basics are, are obvious. And that's always an issue because maybe what I think is obvious isn't what you think is obvious. Um, in the last year, I have actually changed my little basics list around. Not the basics, but the order. And let me just give them to you really quickly. Uh, invest wisely in asymmetrical risks. This comes from my wife, Tiffany. Uh, she works for the Department of Treasury. And, and Treasury, they are constantly assessing and balancing risk. Because if things go wrong in the banking industry, things go wrong everywhere. Uh, if, if you're a homeowner and you suddenly find that you owe a lot of money, but your house is only worth a little bit, that's called being underwater. And it's one of the worst things that can happen to you here in the United States. Uh, you have lots of expenses and very little to show for it. Uh, it's kind of like credit card debt. So what TIFF has taught me is to always look first at those things that at first glance, yeah, that's something we need to think about. But when you stand back long enough in your career, you'll go, these are the keys. There's a second part to that, obviously. So if you're an American football coach, there are certain moments in a game where you have to do something, like one of them is taking a safety. In other words, giving the other team two points. You have to practice that and go over it. Otherwise, your athletes will, you know, in the heat of the moment, it, well, they'll do everything wrong. You have to practice a variety of different kicks and kick returns of, of, of all kinds of... You may never even face some of the situations you're gonna practice. But if you ever do face them, the rewards are so worth the amount of time. There's gonna be more to asymmetrical risk and we'll cover that in the next part. Well, the next key I think in coaching is embrace the obvious. And I, I, I just feel like I always repeat myself when I say this, but throwers throw, sprinters sprint, jumpers jump, swimmers swim, lifters lift, you got to do the basics. In American football, John Heisman said in 1931, block, tackle, and control the ball. That's going to be true until the game is over. Uh, there's a wonderful scene in the movie Bull Durham where the coach is yelling at the team and he says, baseball is a simple game. You throw the ball, you catch the ball, you hit the ball. Most sports come down to those things that are so obvious when you first say them. Uh, I think nutrition is obvious, you know, protein, veggies, water. Well, your job as a coach is to embrace the obvious. In fact, one of the hardest things to do as a coach, and I was told this by Rick Bojack, is you, pointing to my chest, can't get bored. In a sense, doing the obvious is boring. And then the third part of this, of course, is this. Respect the process and the results will take care of themselves. Um, I think it's tough certain times of the year where the fitness industry will start peddling products to do things overnight or two weeks. And yet the truth is, if you had protein, veggies, and water at every meal for a decade, and you got eight hours, nine hours sleep every night for a decade, and you exercised at some low end appropriate level, um, you would have those overnight miracles happening to you. Because sleeping, eating, and exercise, that's the process. Don't worry about the results. If you if you train for your sport intelligently uh, over and over and over again, and you apply uh, appropriate strength and conditioning, you apply appropriate arousal and tension training, uh, and you uh, build yourself up on your competitive ladder. Uh, one day you'll wake up and you'll be the best that you can be. 
That's the process. Don't worry about the results. Let's go a, a little deeper on this. Uh, one day I was in uh, Ireland and we were on a tour. Uh, a friend of a friend's uh, gave us a tour and we were looking at the old ring forts and the stones of the area around Sligo, Ireland. And it is amazing. It is, it is breathtaking to put your hand on something humans made 5,000 years ago before the pyramids and they're still there for you. While we're walking around, we began to discuss this book called The Knowles Credo by Jay Stanton, which is a, a book I, I picked up immediately. And it, <laughs> The Knowles are half hyena, half humans. Don't worry about that. But what really made the book stand out to me was this three-part process that the Knowles always do. Plan the hunt, hunt, then discuss the hunt. When I was successful on a diet called the Velocity Diet. I planned the diet. I bought all the stuff you needed. I did it. And now I can talk about it. But that's the order you have to do things in. You plan something, six weeks, 12 weeks. You do it. And then after you do it, you look back on it and say, we could have done better here and here. The mistake most young coaches make is one, two, three days into the 12-week program, they start tossing things out and adding more. Well, the system uh, that I want you to start thinking about is very similar, but just a touch different. So when we look at the first word here, asymmetrical risks, I always ask the question, if everything we do, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I, people ask me all these questions about why I'm against heavy Turkish get-ups. You know, a lot of load over your face, tired athlete. Well, what's the worst that can happen? Well, the tired athlete might have a grip slip, might slip on the ground, and that 48 kilo bell might come down on their face, their head, or hit major organs. Uh, people do get hurt doing it. So what's the worst that can happen on heavy, heavy Turkish get-ups? Uh, you can kill your client. That's bad. Uh, you'll, you'll probably not have a long career if you start losing people to death while you're training them. Obvious, right? Well, asymmetrical risks, also as a, as a coach, I will consciously think about what's the worst thing that can happen. So for throwers, uh, you generally get three throws in the trial. Well, what if you foul the first two? That's one of the worst things that can happen to you as a thrower. I mean, it's great if you get in the ring on your first throw and you throw your lifetime best. You can just feel the pressure just fall off of you. You'll be so happy. But what if you foul foul now what do you do so we're always preparing with my athletes what's the worst that can happen and then we practice appropriate ways to go around it uh dwight stones famously said before the 76 olympics i'll win the high jump unless it rains and guess what happens folks it rained his competition practice on slick surfaces he did not the next tier is embrace the obvious and all too often, I will sit down with people and they, and they think I'm joking, but what's the obvious solution? Now, I'm, I'm certainly not a fat loss expert, but at some level, fat loss is going to be caloric restriction at some level, either with fasting or uh, changing your macronutrients or, or something, um, <laughs> hiring someone to pull the food out of your mouth. And number two, at some level, you need to do inefficient exercise, uh, exercises that cause you to uh, make your metabolism move up a little bit. Now, of course, the, the, the devil's in the details here. Too much exercise can also, you know, be a struggle. You know, your body will shut down a little bit. And if you lower your calories too much, the famous Minnesota starvation uh, study, 1,500 calories a day, was way too low and these men started uh, to have uh, emotional and uh, mental issues. But the obvious thing is to what Art Devaney said, don't get fat in the first place. Okay, so when you're dealing with teenagers and middle schoolers and even before, talking about the proper nutrition, cut out the sweets and the candy and the garbage, basic stuff, nothing fancy, get your sleep, have some kind of uh, outdoor activity that makes you want to keep going outside. After that, if we have to intervene later on, we're going to have to do more. 
um, more exercise, more caloric restriction. And of course, uh, we all know uh, that it's become very popular in the world today for those who can afford it. Uh, these bypasses and things like that where they shrink your stomach or go in and literally pull the fat out of your body. The obvious solution, quoting Art Devaney, don't get there in the first place. And then respect the process. I always uh, reference back to my first meeting with Coach Mon uh, when I first met him at Utah State. And uh, he basically said very simply, little and often over the long haul. If you want to be a good student, you got to study a little bit every day for a long time. If you want to be a great father or mother or parent, you, you got to spend quality time all the time for a long time. There's nothing fancy here on these this first part. Now, let's take a bigger look and uh, at some more things. And this next part comes from my book, 40 Years with a Whistle. Uh, I jokingly call these the Ten Commandments sometimes. But there's these are the truths I've learned in my 40-year career. Uh, the first is constant assessment. Now, uh, constant assessment means every moment of every day as a coach, you're always looking around. You got to learn to look at your athletes' faces and to see if they're fresh. Uh, if they just broke up with a, a their girlfriend or boyfriend, that's a different going to be a different workout. If uh, if they had to put their dog to sleep that day, as happened to me one time in a training session, and Dick Notmeyer just sat me down and we talked about dogs for about an hour. He assessed where I was that day and realized it wasn't a good day to snatch and clean a jerk. You need to constantly assess the equipment that you have in the place. Does it need replacing? Does it need fixing? Does it need cleaning? You need to look at the floors. You need to look at the sky. You need to look at the weather. You're always assessing. You're always looking <laughs> for the next risk and how to make things better, which brings us to number two, constant upgrading. One of the issues that you might have with me is that I keep tweaking little things like my movement matrix. Well, what I'm always looking for is, is there a better, faster exercise? Is there an exercise that we can find that's easier to teach, faster to teach, and gets the job done as this very complex exercise? Well, for example, uh, with the hip thrust, we I found with the hip thrust, I got many of the benefits of kettlebell swings with, honestly, what, 30 seconds of instruction? Whereas with the kettlebell swing, I always feel like I have to take the person through a three-day course. I keep the kettlebell swing in there, of course, but I'm always looking for a better way to upgrade. It's also true with equipment. I'm always looking for a piece of equipment that does the work of all those things. Um, this, of course, is why I got into suspension trainers. Uh, there had been a gap in my training for years. And the single arm, one arm row with a suspension trainer filled a massive gap in, in our training. So we picked up a whole bunch of them. Number three is a hard lesson for you to learn. Ignore perfect. Um, Every so often, if you're in the field, you'll be at a party and someone will say, well, I'm waiting for the perfect diet. Well, there is no perfect diet. Well, there might be. Uh, I want a perfect exercise program. Well, I don't know what that's going to be because it's going to depend on so many things. So I always tell people, don't worry about perfect. Just get going. As long as you're kind of rolling in the right direction, good things are going to happen. Remember, I'm going to come back to that concept a lot going in that direction, rolling in that direction. See, as a coach, you literally are a conveyance. A coach, like uh, during the, the French Revolution, you know, you're a four-wheeled thing that takes people from here to there. So part of our job is you got to get going. You got to get people on this carriage and you got to get going. Maybe the route you're taking isn't perfect, but at least you're going that direction. The next one is a, a kind of a personal one. Maybe I use it different than most people, but uh, this isn't moral theology. Nothing drives me more crazy when someone says, is this a good exercise? Oh, that's a bad exercise. Don't, don't do those. Those hurt your knees. That hurts your back. Oh, don't eat that food. That's a bad food. Oh, this is a good food. No moral theology. 
Every food that's edible on the planet has its place. Every exercise has its place. Your job, your job as a coach, as a trainer, is to constantly look at these things and say, okay, this fits here, but not necessarily here. For example, I am never going to ban cookies because so many people have traditions involving cookies. Uh, it can be a holiday thing. It can be, uh, it can be a family thing. There are certain ritual foods we eat. Uh, at funerals, very often there are certain foods people eat at funerals. At weddings, there are certain delicacies people will provide at weddings. But that doesn't mean 365 days a year you need to eat those. Number five is a tough one that everyone's going to learn. Everything works. Every idea works. Generally for about six weeks. Uh, my friend uh, Dan Martin calls me uh, Mr. Tw Mr. 91 because I'm the guy you talk to after that 90-day program that you did. Because after six weeks, after 90 days, what, two weeks, whatever the program calls for, they all work. Then what? Or my other book, Now What? Now what do you do? So when you decide to try something new, it's going to work. Every new diet's going to work for you. But sticking to it and transforming that from two weeks to two decades, that's the key. You know, this next one's uh, something I talked about with my daughters when they're growing up quite a bit. Um, achieving a goal versus achieving success. Uh, this is a tough one. Very often, people will achieve their goals and then stand there with this face like, well, to quote Peggy Lee, is that all there is? You got to be very careful about chasing certain goals. Uh, I love Earl Nightingale's concept of what success is. Success is kind of the ongoing progression to a worthy ideal. So, for example, if you want, if you decide to go back to college, I think you're successful because you're on that step towards this worthy ideal. I can't imagine anybody more successful, and Earl Nightingale thought, saw the same, same thing, than a school teacher. Someone who goes in there every day, <laughs> fighting the battles, pushing kids towards you know, their futures. To me, that's success. I've bumped into a lot of people in my life who, who have achieved very big goals, including uh, you know, Olympic teams and medals, who actually that goal might have cut into their success for the rest of their life. They got stuck with achieving the goal and forgot about the other side. This is a tough one. Uh, number seven, after the peak is the cliff. If you decide to spend the next year, eight years of your life to achieve a goal, whether you get it or not, the next step has to be planned too. Um, the problem with after a peak is everything after that can be straight down. Everything after that can be straight down. So that's why I always actively work with my athletes thinking about more and more long-term things. I'll talk to a high school kid about retirement. Well, why would I talk about something that's 50 years away from them, up to 50 years away? Because I'm trying to get them to think constantly down line. What, what's next? So you win the state championship, and that's great. Next fall, I want you to go to university and, and, and begin to work on your, your degree. And after your degree, I already want you in the process of thinking about where you want to do and what do you want to be with your life. <sighs> Number eight is one that not a lot of people agree with me, but I think I'm right. Self-discipline is a very finite resource. Uh, I always tell people that free will is like a can of shaving gel, not cream, but gel. Because when shaving gel goes out, it just suddenly goes out. Cream will spit at you for a few days, and you can think about it. But with gel, pff, gone. And I think if you have children, you probably know what I'm talking about. Because from the moment they wake up and you get them off to school, well, if you have children like I have, they're constantly, uh, my wife and I joke that raising children is like being pecked to death by ducks. Um, 
as you're getting ready, they're, they're everything. Uh, no matter what I made for breakfast, uh, one of my daughters, I'm not going to mention Lindsay's name, complained about it. Even if she asked for it the night before, it was her job to complain about it the next day. Well, by the time you drop your kids off at school and go to work, you know, and you're shaking like this, your, your self-discipline might be gone. I'm always amazed when people tell me that they can just flick a switch with their self-discipline and, you know, lose those 75 pounds of, of excessive adipose tissue, you know, within a two-week period. I just don't see it happen very often. And that's why it's so important to train in community. Number nine here, fundamentals trump everything else. This would be something I'll come back a million times, but the basics, throwers throw, lifters lift, those are going to be the most important things you think about as you move on. Mastery of the fundamentals is going to do more than all the nonsense of those little things, those little add-ons that are magic, the magic pills you see online, the magic fairy bunnies or whatever. Um, basically, many of us look now at training as meat and potatoes and salad and vegetables, and then all those extra things are just spices. Um, they're helpful, but stick with the fundamentals. And number 10, of course, is something very important to me. Take a moment to appreciate those who went before you. Uh, as we go through this course, uh, I will emphasize constantly reading the classic texts in our field. Um, I will constantly reference my personal mentors. Uh, I can't thank Dick Notmeyer, Ralph Mon, Bob Lahati, uh, Coach DeYoung, and so many others enough for the impact they've had in my life. And one of the things I want you to think about as you move into this class is how you've been influenced by your mentors. So if you just step back for a moment and you look at what we've gone through so far, you really do have the basics that's going to stick around for the rest of your career. You're going to run into these concepts forever. Uh, asymmetrical risk, embrace the obvious, the process, these 10 commandments, this is true and this is real. But there's a principle that you really need to know. And it's this simple. It's not what you know. It's what your athlete or your client knows. So it's great if you have all this knowledge up here. But your job is to convey it to your athletes. It's to convey it to your clients. Uh you can be the greatest coach of all time, but if your athletes don't know what to do on the field to play, you're in big trouble. So your job is to always measure what your athletes know. My best coaching has always been when my athletes begin to teach me. That's when I know that we have an extraordinary thing about to happen. The best way I know how to coach is by the use of metaphors. Now, this is a nice little definition here. Metaphors connect what you know to what you need to know. And sometimes, folks, I don't really know uh, how to explain a word. The, the example here is the word work capacity. Now, as a coach, you know, I know what work capacity is. I know what it is. Work capacity. It's ability to do work. Well, maybe. So I came up with a silly little way of saying it, and it's it's a very uh, it's very simple. But you pull up to your house uh, if a couple days before Thanksgiving, and you have eighteen grocery bags in your car. Now, whether it weighs ten pounds or ten kilos, depending on where you live, doesn't matter. But you have eighteen bags, and to get from your car into your kitchen, you have to go up a flight of 10 stairs. Not 10 flights, but just 10 stairs. Well, to me, what work capacity is, is how you answer that problem. How do you get 18 grocery bags from your car into your kitchen? Now, if you're me, you're going to try to load up all 18 bags and go up that flight of stairs one time. 
you know, 180 kilos one time up that flight of stairs. So I only do 10 stairs. Someone else is sitting there going, hmm, I'd rather do 18 loops with just one bag at a time. Someone sitting next to them goes, that's crazy. I want to do nine with two bags at a time. <clears throat> doesn't matter. That matrix that your brain is going through right now, to me, that's what work capacity is. Now, if I want to take a lot of bags on fewer trips, I have the capacity to do that. If I want to take fewer bags and more trips, I got to be able to do that. Folks, that's just a metaphor. Uh, as we go through this, we'll come into a couple other terms. Like I use the word when we discuss uh, Stu McGill Stone, three parts. There's there's anaconda strength. That's that squeezing strength. If you ever carry something heavy right here, you'll feel your your body pushing outwards like you're a, like you're the inner tube of a bicycle tire. I just call that anaconda strength, and most athletes go, got it. Arrow is you turn your body, you turn yourself into an arrow either by, you know, bracing the legs or turning yourself into a missile. Again, I say that, mental image, athletes understand it. And the third is armor. And that literally is toughening the skin so that, uh, for example, when I wrestled, this nostril used to bleed out for the first two weeks of practice, and then it stopped. I don't know why it stopped. I just call that armoring. Uh, when you first... Uh, when you first start playing American football and you're banging your forearms against someone's helmet, you, you get really beat up. And in a few weeks, you don't feel it at all. That's armor. Uh, another phrase we use a lot in, uh, in the throwing arts and kicking arts is bow and arrow. And when you explain the human body as a bow and arrow, many of your athletes lean and go, okay, I know what you mean. Um, Stu McGill, of course, uses this great concept called hammer and stone, boom, boom, which is this great way to explain uh, physics, the physics of athletics. You know, you drive that leg into the ground, boom, you hammer the ground, and your body as a stone pops you back up. If you decide to become a coach or a teacher or a parent, you better get used to saying cliches. Uh, a cliche that really became popular about a decade ago is called the big rocks. You know, the professor comes in and he but puts a bunch of big rocks in a jar and asks, is it full? And the students say yes. Then he adds a bunch of medium rocks. Is it full? Yes. And then he adds sand. Is it full? He's, the students say yes. Um, and so the key, of course, is focusing on what are the big rocks. And in coaching, I think there's three. And there's nothing new here. Uh, if you decide to study religious education, you'll find the exact same three rocks. If you go to any kind of teaching school, they'll probably talk about the same things. There's basically three rocks, okay? The first is the no. And in our field of strength and conditioning, uh, even if you have a degree or an advanced degree, you still have to learn a whole bunch of information. Um, I thought I knew it all probably in my career 30 or 40 times, and then something new would come out. I've been I've gone to suspension trainer certifications, kettlebell certifications, all kinds of different workshops, uh, hands-on two, three, four-day events to increase my ability in the areas of mobility, flexibility, uh, teaching, nutrition. I took a nutrition course. And every year, I feel like I find something that I need to expand on that even more. Number two, of course, is the do. Um, how are you going to get that information out? Now, in religious education, we've always had basically four methods. The first is to tell a story. Uh, it's, I, I have that issue. Uh, my good friend Lyle McDonald always tells me that I can barely clear a sentence without having to tell a story. Uh, show a picture, which could also be in this day and age. You show a video, a movie. Uh, when I first coached, it wasn't that easy. Uh, ask questions, of course, the Socratic method. You can ask questions or encourage your people to ask questions. And then the, the last one is uh, memorize blocks of information. Uh, it, it depends on how you learned your, your month of the year. I was taught month of the year this way, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. 
These knuckles have 31 days, except for this one. These knuckles have 30 days. That's one way to learn how to do it. Or there's a song, January, you know, whatever it is, okay? I, I never learned it that way. Uh, when you try to learn large chunks of information, learning a song or a poem is often the easiest way to hold that into your mind. Uh, it sounds odd at first, but if you can make something into a silly song, your people will never forget it. And of course, the third part of teaching, coaching, is, I have no better way to say it, but savoir faire. Uh, this is this ability to adapt to anything swiftly. Um, sometimes I think you, especially in real time, uh, you're coaching during a game. When you're trying to get information to somebody who's just not understanding it, your ability to switch gears instantly and explain it is savoir faire. Um, one of the great opportunities I've had in my career is working with people with who are hearing impaired, uh, completely deaf in two or three cases, uh, people in other, who speak other languages, and some people who don't see the world that I, in the way I see it. Now, what's good about that is if, that, if they can't hear, you can't tell the story you're about to tell. You have to explain it in a different way. Uh, I worked with a, a transfer student from Japan who I don't think knew the basics of uh, English, especially American English, and I was able to get this young man to the state championship in the discus in six weeks because we focused on stretch, one, two, three, uh, uh, hold, hold the X, and I asked him to attack a statue that we had in the in in the ring mentally, and we called the statue. I think we called it Kami, and uh, it worked. And it was really good for me because I realized that if I'm good enough with my what I know and how I do it, uh, I can keep coming up with new ways to teach people this information. Now the keys to the no are threefold. First, and this takes us right back to uh, asymmetrical risks, the first thing we always want to do is clear, clear out the basic risks. Um, if you have, a, you, you have to assess here. Uh, we need to know uh, injury background. We need to know what you know. For example, I might have this wonderful training program that involves the Olympic lifts. If you don't know how to do them, well, we're at risk if we start. What this will do is highlight the problems we need to address. Uh, if you have mobility issues, we're gonna make sure we spend extra time on mobility. If you have technical issues, well, that's gonna shift a lot of our time over to a different direction. If you're just not strong enough in a certain body part, well, then we know where to go. And then from there, we outline a basic programming map. And honestly, sometimes folks, get back to the definition of the word coach, it is gonna be from here to there. Keeping you on the road is the only program we really need to do. And that's a tough lesson. Sometimes you just got to do what you're going to say you're going to do. So the basics of a programming map, and I have it very simply, I have it in three steps here, or the pirate map, which we'll come back to again. Uh, number one, uh, do no harm. Uh, this is a tough one. There's nothing new about it. Uh, this is the basics of the, the medical uh, uh the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Uh, it's hard sometimes to get this across to young coaches because uh, they want to do things that border on dangerous. Uh, if you're doing heavy Turkish get-ups and depth jumps off a 10-foot platform on the first day of practice, I can guarantee something is going to go wrong and quickly go wrong. Number two, the goal is to keep the goal the goal. Now, this is probably the first comment that I said that ever became a meme, which is kind of cool. But this originally came from the mission is to keep the mission the mission. Uh, if we're sent to do a certain job, part of my job as the leader is to make sure we do that job and not get ourselves lost in all these other directions. Uh, if you decide to run your own business, making a profit is going to be really important to you. Um, yes, your employees' feelings are important, but there's going to come a time where 
you keeping those doors open is be more important than how someone's feeling. And that's a tough one because I think both are important, people's feelings and making a profit. But your goal as a coach is to make sure we get them where they want to be and we want to get them there legally, ethically, morally, and all the other leads you can stick in there. But our job is to keep our mind on where, why we're heading there towards that goal. And of course, number three is something I've always said. Almost every goal you have, somebody's already done it. Just do what they did. Uh, sadly, I've been around some of the best and brightest discus throwers of all time, listened to everything they had to say and go, yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's because I'm stupid. You can do better. Now, on the do, I always joke that I have three assistant coaches when it comes to the do. Coach simplicity, coach repetition, and coach gravity. And each one is important. Coach simplicity, it makes me laugh when I say it out loud, but the easiest way to get from A to B is a straight line. So that is the shortest path to success. Uh, if you want to be a shot putter and throw the shot farther, uh, doing things that make the shot go farther are what you want to do. Uh, doing agility drills, no one's going to throw anything at you while you're in the ring, probably is not going to help very much. Uh, practicing singing probably isn't going to help you very much. Throwing the shot and getting stronger are going to do a lot of good for you. This leads us right to a concept that's probably been beaten up a little bit too much in the last two decades, but it's still true. We've got to find the minimum effective dose for what we want to do. And very often people summarize a uh, minimum effective dose with the phrase, less is more. And I, and I like that. What is the least amount we can do to get to our goals? Just the process of thinking about that can be a career changer for you. When I first met Coach Mon, as I've said before, he told me little and often over the long haul. Charlie Francis, the great uh, Canadian sprint coach, he summarized his technical study like this. If it looks right, it flies right. And I thought to myself, that's strange because when I coach the throws, I can know, I can see when someone has mastery. It just looks right. Tommy Kona, the great uh, weightlifter and, of course, Mr. Universe, said that the American system is simply to get the goal as simply and as quickly as one possibly can. So whatever the goal is, what are the steps to get you there as quickly as you can? Um, he, uh, John Powell, the great discus thrower, Yuri Sadiq, the great uh, Soviet hammer thrower, they all told me the, basically the same thing. Uh, once you specialize in your sport, if you're not world-class in two or three years, you've picked the wrong sport. Well, how do you get to world-class? Listen to Tommy Kono. Finally, Pat Flynn summarized this whole thing with the minus sign equals the plus sign. Less equals more. Coach repetition is, a, is an interesting one. I always feel that my teams, my athletes, are going to out-rep your athletes. We're going to do more, and I have to have, my job is to figure out ways we can get more done in less time than you. And of course, we in program, we call that density training. When I was an administrator, I had a little sign on my desk that said, Rep repetition is the mother of implementation. And what I began to notice when, when you first become an administrator is that you go to a meeting and you tell everybody, from now on, we're going to do X. Three weeks later, you make some follow-up phone calls and people who weren't at the meeting didn't know we're going to do X. Okay, you fix that. But a lot of people at the meeting weren't paying attention, so you have to remind them that we're doing X. Then you have to send out a newsletter to everybody you possibly can and tell them now we're going to do X. At the annual meeting where you have everybody in the building, you tell everybody we're going to do X. And of course, people miss that. You have to tell them X. And what you begin to notice is you tell people X a whole bunch of times. Never assume it got through the first time. Never. Um, that led me, I think, to being a better coach. Uh, there's a phrase here that you hear a lot nowadays. 
Perfect practice makes perfect. I'm just not sure that's always true. I believe you can, you should focus on the things you can improve. Uh, the, the great Blues Brothers joke about, you know, about a wish sandwich. You know, it's two pieces of bread and you wish you had some meat. Um, it's, I've been told by baseball players that you can improve bunting, but you can't necessarily improve hitting. In basketball, you can improve offensive rebounding. But there's other skills you might not be able to improve, like getting your athletes taller and longer. Um, if you're blessed with the right genetics and you're born in the right area and you pick the right event in track and field, I can almost guarantee I can get you to improve. So repetitions are very important as long as they're things that can be improved. Uh, don't worry about getting them taller and longer. Focus on having them do the repetitions. And of course, Coach Gravity comes from my work as a throwing coach. We began to pick up through the years that throwing overweight implements almost universally, I can't even think of an exception, but you always have to have almost in there, improve the thrower's throwing. And I, I came up with a little theory is that if a high school boy is throwing a 12-pound shot and I get him to throw a 20-pound shot, I know this. However far he threw that 20-pound shot, I know he can throw the 12-pound. Um, sometimes this slows things down. Sometimes it makes things more complex. So what I started to do was over-exaggerate certain things. Those things I wanted to make sure that were ingrained. So this was over-exaggeration. Um, if you fouled a throw in practice, uh, we made you, we punished you somehow. Um, I can remember famously, my daughter Lindsay fouled in practice and I made her run one lap. And by the time she got back, because she was trying to make a point about how she didn't want to run that lap, practice was basically over. But if you foul your best throw at the Nationals, the state meet at the Olympics, and it costs you a medal, you'll never forget that lesson. I'd rather punish you in practice so that you don't punish yourself the rest of your life. Um, I was told that there's an Olympic lifting coach who ends practice if you miss a lift. Now, uh, the, Charlie Francis up in Canada did something similar but he, it, with his athletes, but this is interesting. He, say like you're taking a warm-up lift. You know, I'm a strong lifter and I got 40 kilos in the bar and I snatch it. If I miss that lift, well, either I'm not focused, I'm not there, or I'm being lazy, or I'm slow, or I'm hurt, or I'm immobile. Bye-bye, we'll see you tomorrow. Practice is over. You miss, you go. And when I first heard that, I thought that was crazy. But now, the more I think about it, I think it's genius. Finally, in team sports, you might want to find yourself focusing on the, that bizarre, strange play <clears throat> that you might only do once a season or that really elaborate play that you have to practice and practice on. If you practice these set pieces, these difficult plays with a lot of moving parts and you practice it and practice it and practice it, and then you come back to a very simple thing, like in American football, the quarterback sneak or the dive play or the power play or, or whatever, everything seems a lot simpler after you do that. That's coach gravity. Coach simplicity, coach repetition, and coach gravity are my three secret weapons as a head coach. Now, finally, let's talk a little bit about savoir faire. Um, I can barely explain this one without metaphors, and so I use the thing, have you ever heard a good joke? Is it the joke or the comedian? A man walks into a bar. He says, ouch. I don't think that was very funny, but that's a joke. And there's a huge difference between a joke and a comedian. I've got some examples here. You know, at the water cooler on Monday, you heard a joke on the weekend, your buddies are standing around and you tell the joke. Everyone laughs. Ha ha ha, that's funny. And they walk back to your desk and go, oh boy. Saying a joke at the water cooler 
versus a one hour of stand-up comedy is a massive leap in skill as a comedian. And the third one there is even bigger. I, I, I think about someone, I always think about Gene Kelly when I think about what an entertainer is. Uh, song and dance guy, he could act, he could make you cry, he could make you laugh, he could make you sing along. The guy was a quadruple threat entertainer. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. would be similar. There, there's so many other, Rosemary Clooney comes to mind. Um, in the world of savoir faire, you have to stop thinking about yourself as being, as a coach, as being the guy with the joke at the water cooler. Your job is to develop your skill set so that you can, <laughs> you know, you can look over at an athlete and say, you know, first you might say, stay tight. A couple of years later, you can have a whole hour long lecture on squeezing and staying tight. And then later on, you'll be able to take an entire team at once and they'll all have that anaconda stay tightness. This next little part is just a nice little guide for you. And I just call them the 10 general truths of training. First, and this is so obvious, train appropriate to your goal. If you're jogging and running marathons and you want to be a shot putter, you're so far away from the truth. Uh, stop, stop now. Coach Mon, number two, little and often a long haul is by far the best way to plan training. This next one, I have found this to be true so often that I can't believe anyone would disagree with it, but some people do. The longer one takes to get into shape or condition, the longer the shape or condition remains. So if you can have a ramp up of six months before you train, before you start getting intense, that conditioning will stick. Now, number four, you don't always have time for a warm up or a cool down, but I know that warming up and cooling down are essential, maybe not to the physical, but certainly to the emotional and the mental side of an athlete. Uh, Phil Maffetone does great work with this, uh, and it, he has convinced me time and again that that's true. Almost always train for volume foundation before you train for intensity. Now, many people say, well, that's not true because I read that these Olympic lift right, stop. You're reading what these Olympic lifters might have done in an Olympic year or at the national camp, but trust me, in their youth, they train for volume. Which leads us, of course, to number six. You must cycle the workouts somehow. Um, you cannot live on one set to eight the rest of your life. Uh, you cannot just take one tool and just keep beating that one tool in. You've got to have some, some variation in intensity, duration, volume, uh, density, and a, a whole bunch of other words I could pro possibly throw out to you. Number seven, I really believe you should train in a community of some kind. Um, when we had the discus camp and for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, one year, being around discus throwers all day long, talking about the discus, talking about the nuances of throwing, talking about dealing with big time competition. By the time I left there, I was at a different level as a thrower and as a thrower coach. If you can train in community. If you have to invent one if you do. Uh, or take out your credit card, go somewhere, fly in, get a hotel, train at somebody else's facility for a few days, and just expi expand your mind. Which goes right into number eight, of course, train your mind. Uh, I'm a big believer in not only doing meditation to learn to quiet the mind, empty the mind out, and it helps you sleep, uh, but I also think there's value in turning your brain into a bit of a videotape player where you actually can practice your sport sitting, uh, sitting in a bus, sitting in a train, sitting in a plane. Um, that skill set, I think, carries over into the field of play. Number nine is mostly a little hint for life. 
keep your training program in perspective. Um, remember you're going for a goal and if the goal is months from now, you got to know that you're building up your program brick by brick by brick. But at the same time, don't forget all the other important things in life, friends, family, relationship, finances, uh, good food, laugh, go for a walk now and again, take good care of your dog. And then finally, it's the fundamentals, it's the fundamentals, it's the basics, it's the fundamentals. Never lose sight of the simple and the basic. Uh, I have a short little note here to come back to it. We mentioned this before, but I, I think we need to always come back to this. When you're coaching, you're always going to use the four basic methods of religious education. Tell people stories. I had a Dick Notmeyer. I had a kid just like you, and then he'd tell us a story. Um, if I have an athlete who's a young discus thrower and struggling, I'll bring up my mental folder of other athletes I trained who struggled. Number two, show a picture, and that would also include showing videos and, and all the rest now. Uh, let people see it before they do it. Uh, ask questions. That goes both ways, the Socratic method. What do you think will help you throw farther? And, of course, always being able to respond from the questions from your athletes and clients. And when in doubt, memorize a song or a poem. Uh, in, in throwing, we always say, yard by yard, it's hard, but inch by inch, it's a cinch.